Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dewar and this is The Norman Invasion, Part 10, The Return to War. In the last show, we followed King Henry II through his relatively peaceful visit to Ireland in the winter of 1171 to 1172. During his six-month stay, he solidified the Norman presence on the island and their future seemed far more stable. This show opens as Henry leaves Ireland and the relative peace and stability he had instituted proves to be somewhat illusory. As Henry II sailed from Wexford at Easter 1172, he had, to some degree, gained a deceptive picture of Ireland. During his stay, the island had been more peaceful than it had for decades. Despite the incessant warfare engulfing Ireland since the 1150s, no one had attempted to fight Henry. However, the lack of resistance was largely due to the fact that the king had arrived in Ireland with a massive army of well over 4,000 soldiers of all ranks. Had Henry not been backed by such overwhelming force, many of the Gaelic kings who had submitted him might have adopted a slightly more aggressive attitude. His visit had also coincided with the very harsh winter of 1171, another factor which mitigated against war. However, Henry could not stay in Ireland indefinitely, and bad and all as the Irish weather is, it did improve as well. However, as Henry departed Ireland, he was not thinking about the potential problems that might arise due to his absence. He was heading home towards nothing short of a political tsunami. In northern France, two papal legates were waiting for him where he would have to answer accusations of his involvement in the assassination of the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas a Becket, back in December 1170. If this went wrong, Henry could find himself excommunicated. To make matters worse, three of his sons were also fomenting revolt. These events had massive ramifications for Ireland, given it was now part of Henry's kingdom. However, the Normans in Ireland faced their own problems too, as within a few months of the king's departure, upheaval and warfare was breaking out across the island. As we saw at the end of part 9, before he left, Henry had granted the Gaelic kingdom of Mead to Hugh de Lacy, a Norman baron. He had also appointed de Lacy Custos of Ireland, which basically made him the king's representative. Raising up de Lacy to such power was an effort to provide a counterbalance to Strongbow in his lordship of Leinster. There was, however, one hitch in Henry's plan. Mead already had a king. In fact, it had several. Over the previous few decades, most of the powerful kings in Ireland had been laying claim to some or other part of the kingdom. It was obvious once de Lacy attempted to take Mead, he would be met with force. But this didn't stop him. In 1172, he invaded the kingdom from Dublin, pushing as far as the Shannon River, raiding the Monastery of Four in West Mead. It seems during this campaign, de Lacy did not settle lands, but instead established two fortified positions. One at Trim, which would in time become one of the largest and most impressive castles in Ireland, and another at Dulic. Sure enough though, as day followed night, not long after de Lacy and his army raided Meath, tensions with Tiernan O'Rourke, the King of Breffany, a man who had been in control of the eastern half of Meath in recent years, began to brew. For Tiernan O'Rourke, his possessions in Meath were crucial to his power. He came from Breffany, a land in North Connacht, known as the rough third of the province due to its poor landscape. He had grown immensely in stature in the previous three decades and his conquests in Mead were integral to this, as geographically it had been the only direction he could expand from Breffany. To his north lay the O'Neills in Ulster, while to his south lay his powerful allies, the O'Connors of Connacht, both kingdoms too powerful to conquer. If de Lacy moved up into Mead, Tiernan would be forced back into the inhospitable terrain of Breffany. As Tiernan prepared for what seemed like inevitable war with de Lacy, a parley between the two men was agreed to see if some sort of compromise could be agreed to prevent blood being spilled. While the two could settle on a meeting place, the Hill of Ward, an earthen ring fort about two days' ride northwest of Dublin, they failed to agree on little else. 
the negotiating positions were intractable. Tiernan would see a lifetime's achievements undone if he ceded the territory to de Lacy, while de Lacy himself would be a paper tiger in Ireland unless he held significant lands, the basis of power in the Middle Ages. Nevertheless, the meeting went ahead and its outcome was more dramatic than expected. It initially took place with O'Rourke and de Lacy at some distance from each other, communicating through interlocutors, but once basic trust had been established, they began to negotiate face to face, although obviously still through interpreters as the two shared no common language. Indicating that there was still little by way of faith, both men were armed with their personal weapons, a sword for de Lacy and in the case of O'Rourke, his weapon of choice, an axe. Bringing the two face to face did little to move the intractable positions. Amid this increasingly pointless wrangling, Tiernan broke off negotiations momentarily to pass water. What followed next broke the deadlock in the most unexpected fashion. As Tiernan O'Rourke left the negotiations to relieve himself, the Normans claimed that he made some form of signal to his warriors, then at some distance from where he was parleying with de Lacy, after which they launched an attack. One way or another, violence quickly broke out and Tiernan drew his axe and turned on de Lacy. However, the interpreter jumped in front of the Norman to protect his lord. For this, he paid a heavy price, with Tiernan's axe taking his arm clean off. A melee soon broke out as the Gaelic Irish forces of O'Rourke bore down on de Lacy as well. Seeing what was happening, de Lacy's own forces on horseback charged to intercept this Gaelic attack. Meanwhile, at the centre of these events, another Norman, Morris Fitzgerald, had drawn his sword and stepped in to stop Tiernan O'Rourke, killing Hugh de Lacy. Their clash was an unusual sight. Neither were young men. Both were in their sixties. Indeed, Tiernan was pushing 70. Around the dance of death between these two older men, a large struggle saw both men's supporters engaged in battle, but this soon turned against Tiernan O'Rourke's supporters. Yet again, the Norman advantage of using heavy cavalry was proving decisive. Tiernan, realising he could not win, fled. Mounting a horse, it seemed he was about to make good an escape from this disastrous altercation, when both rider and horseman were impaled together by the lance of a Norman knight, Griffin Fitzgerald. Tiernan O'Rourke, the man who had a predilection for making enemies since he had emerged as a major figure in the 1120s, finally ran out of road and died at the Hill of Ward, becoming the first high-profile Gaelic figure to be killed at the hands of the Normans. However, after his death, the Normans were not finished with him. Tiernan was about to become an example. The Gaelic-Irish annals, which outline a very different series of events, it should be said, whereby Tiernan was the one ambushed, tell us that. He was beheaded and his head and his body were carried ignominiously to Dublin. The head was raised over the door of the fortress, a sore miserable sight for the Gael. The body was hung elsewhere with its feet upwards. Regardless of who had been the first to draw swords, and it should be said, both men were well capable of it. The death of Tiernan O'Rourke was a major moment. After Rory O'Connor, the one-eyed king of Breffney, was the most significant figure in Gaelic Ireland. While there can have been few who mourned his death, given he had been an entirely untrustworthy, duplicitous and pretty brutal character, his death was a disaster for most in Gaelic Ireland. It cleared the way for Hugh de Lacy to now push into Meath and massively expand the Norman presence in Ireland. While these events threw Meath into turmoil, similar violence was breaking out as Strongbow too was trying to extend his control in Leinster. While Henry II had conferred Leinster onto Strongbow during his visit, there were many minor Gaelic kings across the province he would need to control if he wanted to dominate it and eventually settle it with his own followers. In 1172, he turned his eye to Offaly. Ruled by the Odemses, the kingdom did not correspond completely with the modern county of Offaly. 
It encompassed flat terrain in South Kildare and eastern Offaly, and then the harsh, inhospitable Schlieve Bloom Mountains along the Leash Offaly border. This wasn't ideal territory for Strongbow to fight in, as we have seen before the Normans fared poorly in hilly terrain. However, when the King of Offaly, Dermot O'Dempsey, was unwilling to submit to Strongbow, he had no other option. O'Dempsey was no doubt, like many others looking at the Normans in Ireland, as a slightly less than imposing force since Henry II had left. Such insubordination was infectious and Strongbow was quick to make an example and illustrate how he would deal with potential challengers. He led a violent raid on the kingdom, taking huge herds of cattle, which were the basis of the Gaelic economy. However, the O'Dempsey's did not allow the raid to go unpunished, and as Strongbow retreated, he presented them with an ideal opportunity as his army began to stretch out, and the rear guard became separated from the main body of around a thousand troops led by Strongbow. Not missing the chance this presented, the O'Dempsey's fell on the isolated rear guard and ambushed them inflicting serious damage. In this attack, Robert de Quincy, Strongbow's constable and key lieutenant, was killed. While by no means one of the key players in the invasion, the death of de Quincy had massive ramifications, as we shall see after the break. After he returned from the incursion into Offaly, the first thing Strongbow needed to do was to replace the constable of Leinster, Robert de Quincy, who had been killed. Luckily, given what the position entailed, there were many Normans in Ireland who could fulfil the role. The constable was effectively the commander of Strongbow's troops, a military leader, of which there were dozens in Ireland. Indeed, the problem seemed to solve itself when the perfect candidate, Raymond Le Gros, presented himself to Strongbow for the position. Raymond was ideal. He had been one of the Earl's key supporters since the earliest days of the invasion. Even though distantly related to the other leaders, Morris Fitzgerald and Robert Fitzstephen, he had shown the most loyalty to Strongbow. Raymond had arrived in Ireland a few months before Strongbow to pave the way for his arrival. He had then gone on to win the crucial victory at Bag and Bun before commanding the forces at the Siege of Waterford. He had then led the defence of Dublin during that turbulent summer of 1171. He was also highly popular with the troops. Gerald of Wales described him as generous and lenient, careful and thoughtful, and although a man of very great courage and skilled in the use of arms in war, it was his sound judgment that marked him out. He was clearly the perfect person to lead the troops. However, surprisingly, Raymond's overture to Strongbow was rejected. The reason for this rejection was due to Raymond's conditions. He wanted the hand of Basilia Fitzgilbert de Clare, Strongbow's sister, in marriage. This, however, spelled potential problems. Strongbow and his wife, Aoife MacMurra, through whom he based his claim to Leinster, had yet to have any children. Were he to die without an heir with Aoife, Raymond Le Gros might try a muscle in on the family lands through Basilia. Indeed, even were Strongbow to die with children, Raymond might still try and succeed him anyway. In this context, raising up a man like Raymond, who is a potential rival, was just too dangerous. This was a major slight though to Raymond. He had shown Strongbow nothing but loyalty and now in return he was being humiliated. He, like many other Normans, had come to Ireland seeking advancement but it was clear Strongbow was going to block Raymond's rise. So he decided enough was enough and he left Ireland returning to his father's castle in Carew in Wales. The fallout from his departure would be enormous given Raymond's popularity. However, this would take a few months to boil to the surface because in late 1172 the Norman world was convulsed by war elsewhere. This war was crucial to developments in Ireland as it effectively drew de Lacy's advance in Mead and Strongbow's advance in Leinster to a halt. After Henry II had left Ireland at Easter 1172, he met with the papal legates investigating the assassination of the Archbishop Thomas of Becket at Avranche in Lower Normandy. There, the legates and Henry came to a political compromise. The representatives of the Pope, the legates, 
accepted Henry did not want Becket killed, while the king accepted that words he had said in anger about Becket had been misinterpreted as an order or desire to have him killed. As part of his punishment, Henry had to reaffirm respect for papal authority and respect for the autonomy of the Christian church in England. He also agreed to take the cross against one of the Muslim powers of the day, in the shape of the Almohad Caliphate on the Iberian Peninsula or the Abbasid Caliphate in the Middle East. However, if Henry ever intended going on crusade, this soon fell off the agenda. Before the year 1172 was out, three of his sons, including the future king, Richard the Lionheart, allied with their mother, the most powerful woman of the age, Henry's wife, Eleanor of Aquitaine, and rebelled against the king. This revolt quickly spread with the Scottish king, William the Lion, and the king of France, Louis VII, both using the chance to attack Henry. With many of his vassals supporting his rebellious sons, Henry was in a desperate situation and he called on his subjects in Ireland to come to his aid with both Strongbow and de Lacy rallying to the king. They left Ireland and arrived in Normandy in early 1173 where both men distinguished themselves. De Lacy mounted a great defence of the town of Vernoye while Strongbow held the fortress of Gizur for Henry. All expansion in Ireland, though, was put on hold, and this war indicated that Ireland was now being dragged into the Norman world, where events in England, Wales or France could affect the island. Indeed, if Henry II was defeated, given that Strongbow and de Lacy had both lent major support to the king, the consequences could be enormous in Ireland. A defeat for Henry could easily result in widespread war on the island between the Normans, by the summer of 1173, the war had settled into a prolonged conflict and Henry needed more troops. So, while de Lacy stayed with the king, Strongbow was sent back to Ireland to raise an army. However, when he arrived, he found the island in a chaotic state. Arriving sometime in late 1173, Strongbow fulfilled his mission for Henry mobilising more troops and sending them overseas. This saw some of the best Norman leaders leave Ireland, including Robert Fitzstephen and Maurice de Prendergast, men who had been on the island longer than anyone else and understood its problems intimately well. They went on to play a key role at the Battle of Fornham, a crucial conflict which began to turn the tide for Henry against his sons. However, there was much fighting still left to do and Fitzstephen would remain in England well into 1174. Meanwhile, in Ireland, a major crisis was brewing on almost every front. As we saw in the last episode, the winter of 1171 through 1172 had seen horrific weather. Storms had battered Ireland while disease ravaged Henry's army and food shortages and famine followed. While the weather did improve in 1172, disease followed in the wake of the famine of the previous winter. Vast numbers of cattle died, something that was disastrous in terms of sustenance, given dairy products were a key source of protein. This calamity was followed then by what was described as a great pestilence in 1173, which decimated the population in the south and west of Ireland. While they tried to fend off the disease that was sweeping through Ireland, Strongbow and his Normans were increasingly in an incredibly weak position as so many of the Norman leaders had left Ireland to fight overseas for Henry II. However, things soon got decisively worse when the ramifications of Strongbow's decision to cast aside Raymond Le Gros returned to haunt him. Henry II had given Strongbow money on his return to Ireland but this soon ran out and the army was no longer being paid. History is littered with incidences of mutiny provoked by a lack of pay and given Ireland was racked with disease and misery it didn't take long for the soldiers to start grumbling. Strongbow, as clever a politician as he was a shrewd army commander immediately recognised the danger when his soldiers selected representatives and brought before him their grievances and a series of demands. The key demand was that Strongbow had to recall Raymond Le Gros from Wales or else his troops would leave Ireland, or even worse, defect to the Gaelic-Irish. 
the latter threat of defection wasn't just an empty bluster. As we covered in part 4, in 1169, the Norman leader, Maurice de Prendergast, had done exactly this when Dermot McMurrah had tried to prevent him leaving Ireland. Strongbow had no choice but to give in to the army's demands, and he wrote a letter to Raymond Le Gros in Wales, asking him to return to Ireland and offering him his sister Basilia's hand in marriage. Raymond instantly agreed, given this was what he wanted all along. Within a few weeks, he was sailing across the Irish Sea with 15 ships and over 400 more troops, led by 30 knights, mainly drawn from his relatives. Even with Raymond on the way back, though, Strongbow was still in danger. Across Ireland, it was obvious the Normans were severely weakened and there were grumblings of revolt. Indeed, Raymond only arrived at the port of Wexford just in the nick of time as the first signs of revolt came to the surface. Gerald of Wales, the chronicler, tells us that only Raymond's arrival at Wexford stopped a planned uprising by the citizens. Having secured Wexford for the Normans, he travelled then to meet Strongbow, who was at Waterford, and the two then returned to Wexford, where Raymond was to marry Basilia. However, once they left Waterford, this town's population now revolted against the Normans, illustrating their weakened position. The governor, Fratellus, was assassinated, and this was followed by a bloody and violent wave of killings of Normans in the streets of Waterford. However, in the end, the Normans did manage to cling to power in Waterford and the revolt failed. Perhaps in a sign of just how weak the Normans were at this point, they appear not to have carried out their own wave of retribution, as could be expected. After his marriage to Basilia, Raymond took up the position of Constable of Leinster and overall commander of Strongbow's troops. His immediate problem, though, wasn't the imminent threat of revolt across Ireland, but instead the morale of his troops, and this was solved in a pretty brutal manner. Raymond didn't, as we might expect, make an example of the troops who had threatened mutiny, but instead he indulged them with an orgy of raiding, violence and theft in an effort to make amends for their outstanding back pay. The victim in all this was the O'Feelands, the Gaelic family who ruled territories surrounding Waterford. Not only had they submitted to Henry II when he had been in Ireland, which should have afforded them protection, but there was absolutely no context to the raid and violence other than to say the demands of the Norman soldiers. Under Raymond de Gros, the Normans swept through the O'Feelan's territories, pushing as far as the monastery of Lismore, which was raided, before they returned to Waterford, laden down with the booty of war. While this quelled the talk of mutiny, there was a serious storm brewing in Ireland. The Gaelic Irish knew the Normans were still vulnerable, even with Raymond de Gros' arrival, as most of the leaders were overseas. By the end of 1174, one of the greatest Gaelic armies, perhaps in Irish history, would join forces to take on Strongbow and Le Gros. While this was spearheaded by Rory O'Connor, he was joined by most of the powers of Gaelic Ireland, including the O'Neills of Western Ulster, an unprecedented move. It seemed the solidifying impact Henry II had had on the situation in Ireland was undone. Next week, as I said at the break, we will look at the history of protest in medieval Ireland and then we will return to the invasion. Until then, Sláinte.